So it's time for the next show of the iPhotography podcast. Thank you so much. It's Stephen again. If you recognize my voice by now, if you've listened to, to numerous previous podcasts or you've caught us on YouTube before doing these shows. Um, today, we have brought along, or we've invited, I should say more specifically, a brilliant photographer in the name of Nikki Thomas. So Nikki um, is a portrait photographer. I think he does many different things, but I'm sure we'll discuss that. Um, it's not just portraiture. Um, there's a few different variations to his, to his work. And he's a business owner. He actually has his own um, photography studio down I think it's in Kent or let's just say the south of England I'm sure we'll talk about it anyway so he's got his own studio down south in England um, and I thought it'd be a fantastic opportunity to talk to him and actually kind of you really discuss the the realities of what it's like being a business owner and a photographer you know how that's changed really from him from before he was a business owner you know what he's enjoying about it what the problems are because there's a lot of people that though they may not be necessarily looking to buy their own premises and, and start up a photography studio. You may be actually just looking to convert a spare room or, or a garage or a shed or something like that. And so, you know, it's interesting to actually know kind of how people do that, you know, and what the realities are, as I say. So we've got Nicky kind of with us today, and we're going to have a little chat through that. I've got all the links for the description in the descriptions, um, whether you're watching this as a video or listening as a podcast, um, to all of Nikki's like websites, etc. So please, please check them out because he's an absolute awesome photographer and he's a really really nice guy um so yeah we're just going to kind of crack on with the show um obviously if you enjoy it please like subscribe follow do all those things that you need to on the internet to be able to catch the next episode so thanks so much for listening let's crack on So welcome along, Nikki Thomas. Uh, you know, for our listeners who don't know you already as well, are you are a, um, well, how would you define yourself as a, as a photographer? As a, is that you portrait photographer, fashion? Uh, lifestyle, I like to class it as. Yeah, so anything that sort of lives. Um, I'm, I don't really do sort of landscape photography or anything like that. So yeah, move, movement, people, fashion, that's my kind of remit. So, I mean, for being, if you're, if you're an eye photography student, if you're someone that's listening who's been on eye photography, you'll probably know a lot of Nikki's work already because you've won kind of, you've won a kind of a couple of awards from us in the past, haven't you? Am I right to say? Yeah. Uh, image of the year in 2017. I have a feeling actually now I'm actually looking at myself on the screen and I look before, I think that image just kind of above my shoulder is that's your one. If I just tilt it up a little bit so people can kind of see it, yeah, it's actually kind of up on our wall in the, in the studio here. It's that good. But, uh, but yeah, obviously, you know, you're, you're very, very established now and that you're uh, you're full time as a, uh, a studio owner, et cetera, which we'll come to on a little bit, but just for people that aren't familiar with you, Nikki, could you kind of give us a little bit of a, a backstory to your photographic journey from when you kind of first picked up a camera to now what's it been like um <clears throat> yeah it's, it's been it's it's been fast if anything it's been quite um it's been a good journey i mean i literally picked up a camera over a conversation with two friends um one worked for sky did some editing um for like olympics and stuff like that um and i I always had a fast fascination with photography. I used to do um, scuba diving and I used to have an underwater camera um, in housing. Um, so I was like, I want to get back into it. And I had two young boys, um, two little sons, and I wanted to take pictures of them growing up. So that was my sort of background for wanting to get back into or actually take up photography as well. Um, but yeah buying a camera 350d off a friend for a hundred pound that was stuck up in his loft that's <laughs> pretty much how my photography journey started to be honest oh wow it's so many people uh, that i spoke to on podcast they started off i mean either with like a, a compact camera but a lot of those were canons and even if they're dslrs they're canons it just seems to be like a uh, you know a, a go-to kind of entry-level kind of camera brand to find but are you shooting are you shooting on canon still no um i'm i'm i've gone over to sony now i did the yeah. same thing what 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 um which body are you shooting on i've got the a7r3 as my main and i've got the a7r2 as a backup uh -huh. but i'm just about to get rid of that and go for two a7r3s i just find it so much easier to yeah keep it, um, especially with weddings um having like a 50 like a 35 and 85 is predominantly my two lenses yeah so having the same body same lenses like you know 
yeah Michael it, Lindsay's and everything. just gives you that consistency I suppose and you know straight away the camera inside out so if you've got I suppose custom settings and things like that you know yeah. straight away where they are and you can just jump to them forwards and backwards it's, really. yeah it's the same with the batteries as well the batteries are all the same well, well the batteries in the a7r2 are tiny and they last nowhere near as long as the a7r3 so that's another thing as well having a big set of spare batteries for the free yeah um yeah and like you say the settings and everything so much better in good sense yeah definitely so so now you've gone on you know after having that that 350d obviously you've progressed now and for people that are, are watching the youtube version you actually got you see nikki in your own studio down in uh in rochester in uh not kent, kent. It is kent yeah, it is yeah. Kent. It is i was kent, gonna yeah. say essex but i was thinking no that's a bit more north right yeah see so down in rochester in, in in kent but i mean how how long have you had the studio I got, I got the studio in November, just before the lockdown. So oh <laughs> timing is perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is yeah, definitely um, wasn't the best, if I'm honest. But yeah, it is what it is. You it's can't, one of those. You, yeah, I suppose not many people saw that coming, really. And, and if, <laughs> no, it, if they did, no, we didn't get. To no one saw that. No. <laughs> no. But, yeah, I mean, I mean, on that topic itself, really, because that's that's like one of the reasons that I wanted to bring you onto the podcast. Because I think it was well, maybe a couple of weeks ago, um, I saw like an Instagram story from you, and it was like a little bit of a rant about how someone had, I think they'd had a book to you, um, and they didn't turn up, or somebody was kind of asking the world from you and effectively yeah. offering you know nothing in return, really. But you know, being a, a pro photographer and a studio owner, I suppose it comes with a lot of pressures, and I don't want you to kind of sugarcoat it or anything like that because I think it's important for people to actually know the realities yeah. of it but what what is actually like you know running your own studio and managing it and being the photographer there the it's 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 an eye-opener um a massive eye-opener like obviously when you hire a studio you go in things are laid out for you um and then obviously you do your shooting you tidy up hopefully and <laughs> that that's a critical thing um but yeah <laughs> You tidy up, you go home, you edit your shots. With doing it in your own studio, it's you, you get a lot of people messaging you because they know you've got your own studio saying about portfolios. Would you be up for shooting with me for um, for your portfolio? Although you're sort of <laughs> more established now. So, you know, I've got, I work for an agency or I've got 600 likes on Instagram and stuff like that. It, it becomes so repetitive. Yeah. Um, I've literally had, five requests a day for um portfolio shoots um apparently it'd be really good for my portfolio it's things like that that's where it gets a little bit draining um the other thing with having your studio is you build it around how you like to shoot yeah um you buy the props you buy the lighting the reflectors the modifiers and everything and i'm very i would shoot a scene, a shoot, a look, and then I would put that back. Other photographers aren't like that. No. <laughs> Not everyone's got the same sort of mindset as you. So someone would shoot something and then just leave it on the floor. And then by the time like they're tripping over stuff, it just looks. So that's another sort of challenge with me, really. It's like, it's like um, good housekeeping, isn't it, really? I suppose yeah. It, you, you've yeah, paid definitely. for that stuff as well. You've you've invested your, your everything into it, so you're going to look after it more. And yeah. do, do you, I mean, with that said, do you um, hire out your studio to, to other photographers? I do. Um, I'm very selective. Uh, <laughs> I always make sure that they've got, like, insurances and stuff because, you know, the equipment's not cheap. It, yeah. it's, it's not cheap at all so um some photographers get actually quite a rate when you ask about insurance um they say how dangerous is your studio mm. but it's not the case of how dangerous my studio is it's you know if they're asking a model to stand up on a top of a ladder for instance yeah how should that be down to my insurance um and also you know things get broken but my insurance sort of claims if you're hiring it out then that's down to them um yeah. but yeah no it's it's a really good point because i i appreciate there's maybe not you know thousands and millions of people that are listening here that are just about to open their own photography studio but it's maybe something people may be considering in the future or even if it could just be at their own home maybe they've converted a room or the garage or something like that and they're going to kind of invite people in they would yeah. you'd, you'd recommend that they'd still need insurance wouldn't they just as you oh, say 100%. yeah 100 percent. i mean so many things can happen you've you know 
you, you have leads about and stuff and I know you cover the lead. Um, I try and keep my, like looking around my studio now, a, a lot of my plug sockets are high, mm. high up so that, you know, you can shoot along walls and stuff like that. So they're not in the frame. You haven't got to go into Photoshop, take them out. Um, but yeah, I mean, things happen. That That's the thing. People are people, people have accidents. It's so yeah, definitely insurance. But the other thing with hiring it out to photographers is if someone's a photographer that shoots similar to what I shoot, I'm quite, I actually want to be doing that shoot. <laughs> I, I don't really want to be giving somebody else the luxury of everything that I've created yeah. for them to earn a, a few quid. I'd rather be doing it myself, if that makes sense. <laughs> do you, do you um, go and get like all the best props and all your best backgrounds and just go and hide them away <laughs> when they get my book? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty, Savage, pretty much. but I love it. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, I've got like a couple of um, canvas painted backdrops. Yeah. And I mean, they're very good for headshots. They're very good for like artistic dance and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, they were like 400 pound a piece. Oof. So it's not the sort of thing that you want to just let somebody use who's, you know, the thing is people aren't, there is a lot of people that respect your studio, but a lot of people, it's not theirs. No. So they haven't got the same, you know, they don't value things as the same as what you do. So yeah. like I will roll my backdrops up and, you know, make them all nice and everything like that, especially the painted ones. But as soon as I know I'm hiring it, they're gone. Yeah. They're, uh, <laughs> they're hidden away in my office kind of thing so i hope you don't have any kind of prospectors uh prospective uh hirers listening to this <laughs> and then they'll be going like, where, I, where are all these <laughs> i'll tell them anyway that is it's, it's like hard it's like you've got you've got the stage you've got like the lighting i'll come and position stuff for you i won't do the lighting for you yeah because that's that's me teaching if in yeah. theory so that's extra <laughs> yeah yeah well, i mean that's a nice thing though as well that you can you can offer a range of services that it's not just you shooting as a as a photographer but obviously you like you hire etc i mean do you do like workshops and things like that yourself yeah um funny enough this morning i've been teaching um because the sunlight is really really harsh and a lot of people are trying to shoot outdoors mm. um making the most of the weather because like obviously technically you don't really want to be stuck in a studio and the weather's like this nice and this has got air con but um yeah, I've been teaching today, sort of high speed sync, um, yeah. using the weather and brilliant. I mean, really wait, I mean, as as you like, I mean, was that kind of part of your original plan when you went to kind of you know set up the studio as a business in a sense? But or have you had to kind of diverse a little bit with you know time and obviously like with you know with everything that's gone on with COVID, etc. Because it's interesting to know how photographers kind of make money these days. Obviously, you yeah. know, the running your own studio you know has a huge impact upon initial costs and setups, etc. But have you had to find that you've had to kind of diversify in what you do or what you offer as a service, not just as a photographer, like you said, you're a tutor, but you're also, you know, a premises owner. But do you, did you always expect that from the start? No, <laughs> it's not really. No. Um, to be quite truthful, I was, I was always quite, I'm, I'm very critical of myself and I still don't believe that some of the shots that I produce are my work. Um, still very humble with it all, especially because it was, it was, this is a hobby that's now turned into a career. Yeah. So I'm very grounded with it. I haven't gone to that stage and I'm never going to go to that stage where I sort of like pick myself up as such, but with regards to the studio and, and, um, the way I, I realized, um, I, th I think it was more during lockdown that I don't have to be shooting myself every time every day all the time there is other ways to make the money through the studio via you know um workshops st um student days um getting brands in hiring it out to videographers there is other aspects of it and the thing is with shooting every day i had such a backup of editing because i don't outsource any of my editing either so i do it all my own so you have to have a downtime at some point. So if I've worked seven days one week, I need to edit them images and I don't want to be staying up till, you know, two o'clock in the morning and stuff like that editing because a whole part of my studio and going self-employed is that I gain some kind of work-life balance Yeah. and having two young boys and working shift work in the past all my life, I now want it to sort of like, you know, my wife's self-employed, I'm self-employed. So, if I take a week off to edit, 
it's nice that I can then hire the studio out and yeah. earn off of somebody else. That's the way I sort of look at it now. But obviously, well, I yeah, prefer- you can balance the costs, I suppose you say, because yeah. normally for self-employed people, yeah, you, you take a, a holiday, you're not getting paid, you know, no one's going to kind of no, uh, exactly. fill in your holiday pay. So as you say, you've got other variations uh, of, of how you can kind of bring in income, which is really nice. And it, it actually kind of leads on again smoothly to, to my next question, because from maybe being before um before you were a studio owner it's kind of what it's like now for you how how often would you say you've actually got a camera in your hands kind of what percentage maybe of your of your oh. week in comparison to what you were before when you were you know not professional nowhere near as much really yeah nowhere near as much i mean the thing is now it's it's changed whereas i do have a couple of down days where a month that i shoot for myself I had a good friend tell me that like you need to shoot for yourself to keep everything fresh, to keep your mind ticking over, to keep like being creative. But because I know my studio and I know my setups and I've got everything laid out how I want it, when the models come in, it's sort of you still you're still providing a a service, you're still providing an experience. But I know that I've got the shot. So rather than overtaking it, I'm saying, right, we're good. Like if you're shooting tethered, show them on the computer to sort of slow the time down a little bit. But yeah, yeah, very, very different with regards because it's more sort of trying to out get work in. Yeah, it's, it'll spend more time on the computer if anything. Um, yeah, emails. It, it's a business now, whereas before, obviously, it was just like I'll go and shoot and. Sort that's of that. that's it. Yeah, you could just you say, you pick up the camera and and just do what you want without any you didn't have a deadline to hit you didn't have necessarily clients that you have to you know the fulfill the yeah. services that you've offered them etc but you know with all that to one side obviously you, you've already touched on that there's massive learning curve to, to being a business owner but like you said the reason that you got into this to begin with is that you wanted to make a better work-life balance for yourself and your family etc and obviously enjoy what you do as a as a profession but do you feel that you've hit it? Do you feel, have you found things that are, make it really, really worthwhile? Oh, massively. Uh, do you know, through all my, I started work when I was 15 for, a, I used to be a mechanic um, and I worked on sort of in, in a workshop all my life. And I can't recall a single day that I went in and actually got any thanks or praise or anything like that of sorts. Yeah. Um, Whereas when you show somebody an image, um, especially like some people that come in quite, you know, they come in on the edge of a little bit nervous and obviously it's, it's down to you to make them feel comfortable and stuff like that. And then you take a couple of shots and you show them the images, the reaction, I'll, I'll never get bored of the reaction. Yeah. Like it's like, wow, it, that, that's me sort yeah. of thing. And you say, yep, yeah, that, that's definitely you. That, that, <laughs> you can't. You, you can't put a price on that. And, and to be coming into work, like I come into work, I used to go to work in overalls. I used to come home dirty because I used to be working with oil and stuff like that. I come to work now in a shorts and a t-shirt. I put my music on. So nice atmosphere. I like my house music. So it's all quite lively and <laughs> everything in here. And then I'm, I'm shooting people. Do you know, it's like, yeah there's nothing to be sort of down or no. anything like that about. So it's such a great feeling to come in to, to do that kind of job and, and, and the reaction you get when you send the images over, the response you get from social media and, you know, um, even like yourself, you guys getting in touch and stuff like that, you know, yeah. that that's, that's amazing. It's, yeah. it's really good. No, and I, and, and I can see that. I mean, I, I, prior to, to coming on along and tutoring I used to work in a, a studio as well so I didn't do anything in the way of um, a lot of the lifestyle stuff that you did it was a little bit more kind of family portraiture really so it's, it's a little bit more conservative but you're totally right you hit the nail on the head and just reminded me of the times that you get I say ardent critics but that's people being critical of themselves like you said not appreciating themselves having a lot of body consciousness etc and you shoot them the right way and you treat them the right way and you give them great service and when you show them those photographs and they are literally like gobsmacked and that is a feeling you think yes you know i've won them over i've i've made a big difference whether they you know they they spend a lot of money or not or anything like that's fine but 
it's it's more changing perceptions um and it gives more and more credence to your ability as a photographer and an artist really that you know are you finding now that you get more and more people it's like word of mouth you know people talking about nikki thomas and, and coming along to your studio and in your area i mean do, do people travel quite a, a fair way to come and see you now if i'm honest people come from further afield than actually in my area <laughs> it, it, it's, it's mad i've i've there's, there's a couple of dance schools, local dance schools that I shoot a lot of their, um, their students, which is great. And they've been really supportive over the years, use a lot of my stuff in their promotions and their adverts and stuff. But I literally have a dance school, dance college that is 400, 500 meters away from the studio. Oh, wow. And I haven't shot a single student from there. Mm. Um, it's just, it's just the way it is. Um, yeah. I get like Rochester station. It's not too far. So. A lot of people come down from London because it's only a short, short, fast train journey to uh, Rochester. So yeah. they come down from London and it's, it's nice. It's, it's quite humbling. Manchester, uh, Bristol. So yeah, people have traveled quite a distance, which is quite good. It's, it's, it's nice. It's like, um, it just reminds me of, I think I was watching it the other day, that, that movie about Facebook. Um, and it was basically about the, the business model and how they approached um, getting schools, you know, because initially they were just like a university or college own um, or specific platform so you couldn't kind of access it just as a as person outside of these universities and there were certain places that they wanted to get as businesses so for yourself had it been like that dance school that's just around the corner because they couldn't get to them or couldn't get them incorporated or whatnot they went to all the other schools around the area and basically kind of made them jealous that they weren't being part of Facebook at that time and I think that could be a good kind of process for you is that you yeah. get all these other massive dance academies interested and it's, it's literally a case that they're thinking right we need to jump on board of this so I, I wish you luck on that sense as well yeah, no, that, that'd be yeah. absolutely brilliant but I mean out, out of all the different areas of photography that you do I mean there's I suppose you class everything under lifestyle but there's there's dance, there's, you know, is the kind of traditional portraiture? What kind of areas do you cover? Um, well, after winning that award with yourselves, with the dance shot, the dance really took off for me. Um, and obviously, I, I, <laughs> I'm honest. Um, when I used to get booked, I used to have to say to the parents, listen, I don't know dance. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not a dance photographer. I'm not a dance photographer as for say, like there is some amazing dance photographers out there, but I come in from after I got the camera and doing a lot of sports photography, action and high speed, I was able to capture it. Hmm. So what I always got the dancers to do was do the shit, do, do the, um, show me the, sh the shot that they wanted and I would watch them see how they, they extend how the legs where the legs would go everything like that and then I would time it and I just seem to have quite good timing um yeah. but obviously as time went on it turned more into shooting some older dancers um and the older dancers needed portfolios for going out into the industry um so it would become more headshots dance shots um obviously they've been working for like three four years in the, in the college so they're they're in their best shape so a lot of model agencies want body style shots yeah so that would be that would class as like your lingerie stuff like that as well and then just yeah just a whole sort of incorporate everything really yeah um so it was nice because it having dance the sports the fashion the headshots it's all quiet close it's all quite similar it's, yeah so i mean do you have like a within those niches do you have like a particular favorite anything that you think you know if you could just thing, you say yeah. for your own projects the thing is with dance no matter how how often you shoot it 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 just looks so good on the camera it looks and and the elegance and the skill of the dancer and they're all different as well you know you've got different body shapes you've got different looks different hair colors lighting captures them all so different and being able to see that in front of you and then seeing that image come to life dance is always going to be sort of at the top the really. favorite thing yeah i suppose yeah, that yeah it's the thing that's yeah i mean it stands out in your portfolio i'm just kind of glancing across on my screen now and i've, I've got your um your, your instagram and your website up as well it's i mean you, you're very 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 diverse but you know you're 
you're very competent at everything that you do really, but certainly the dance, I think it's probably just something that I don't see a lot of online. I see a lot of, uh, you know, uh, modeling kind of imagery, et cetera. Some of it's absolutely horrendous, you know, some fashion, some editorial, but I think, you know, to have that kind of niche in a way, like being, you know, as you say, though you're not a dance photographer, you are actually a very, very good dance photographer. Um, I think it, it's brilliant to stand out like that because there, it's it's quite a saturated market being a photographer these days, or especially going pro. So to find yeah. something that you're very good at um, will help you stand out immensely as well. And I think that's that's certainly kind of some of your strongest work. But um, but before I let you go, I've got kind of, I suppose, like two little questions ready. One is yeah. the one that we do on all of our um, podcasts that we call our time travel question. And it's it's simply really to kind of get everyone's opinions on to, as to what they think, you know, would have helped them kind of uh, down the line, you know, when they were younger, kind of as a, as a starting out photographer. Dave, you kind of cast your mind back to when you had that 350D for 100 quid. What would you have told yourself if you could kind of travel back in time to make photography a little bit easier for you, even if it's just, you know, as you were starting out the business um, or something like that? Is there any kind of bit of advice that you could have given your younger self? Yeah. I, 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 I would say just go out and shoot mm-hmm. and don't get too hung up on gear yeah. and equipment, if that makes Because I, I do feel that when I started out, and then really got involved in it, I was sort of gear orientated. I felt like I needed to have this, I needed to have that. Um, Even though I did hold my back, myself back from buying a lot of it. Well, I didn't, my wife did. (laughs) 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 Um, I would say, yeah, just the best way to learn is to shoot. Yeah. Just go out and shoot. Um, That's what I would have told myself to make it a lot lot easier. Um, I I mean, I I did do a few things that that helped um, but obviously my wife got bored of modeling for me. So she's a hairdresser. So I used to use her old Sally head doll's head. Yeah. Put that on a little tripod. And then I just got some continuous lights um, and just moved it around just to see how the lights fell on the face. Sort of little bits and bobs like that, really. But, but it makes yeah, a difference. Equipment. But as, as for a business owner, if I could tell myself something, it probably would have been don't buy a studio just before a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> Now that would have been some amazing insights, but, but yeah, yeah no, you, you, you're so right with going out and just shooting. Cause I was talking to someone um, the other day on, on a podcast and, and they said the exact same thing. Don't get hung up on when you're starting out on shooting one particular thing all the time, just, just go and enjoy it to begin with, because especially when you become more professional and you've got demands and you've got contracts and clients, et cetera, you maybe are a bit limited as to what you can shoot given yeah. your time, but but yeah, I think it, it's a very, very good point. And, and obviously for anybody that's listening to this as a podcast, um, you know, if you've been watching it as a YouTube video, you'll see lots of images that we've put up of Nikki's. But otherwise, um, if you've just been listening to it as a podcast, I'm sure people are going to want to find out more about you, Nikki, whether it's the way I book you for a shoot or plead you to come along to your studio if that allows, <laughs> um, or just to at least kind of see, uh, you know, some of the images that have been talking about. But ultimately, where's, uh, what's your website and what's your, uh, your Instagram, et cetera? Where can we find you online? Uh, my website is Nikki Thomas dot photography. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just literally just that. And uh, Instagram, I'm Tomo 300, T-H-O-M-M-O 300. Um, it was just my nickname, to be honest. Um, nice it's the easiest ones to keep. Yeah, it was it, my really? nickname. I started that up. I started my Instagram just as, a, as, as my own basic sort of personal Instagram. And I've been called Tomo for years through from friends and everything like that so it just sort of stuck and then when I started shooting and I started going to brands and shooting everyone kept calling me Tomo yeah so (laughs) it just sort of stuck really so that's it you can become like ranking you know you just you just know them by one name then from there (laughs) like LA or Maradona or somewhere um and and I know you're very precious and wisely so with your studio but if you want to give your studio a bit of a plug just in case there's anybody living down in the south of England that is looking for a very very high end studio to potentially rent now bearing in mind Nikki does have extremely high standards so don't be offended if he says (laughs) no but what's the name of your studio Nikki? It's, it's the loft studio Rochester 
Brilliant. There we go. So again, we'll, we'll put all the links to the description. So anybody yeah, who's listening or watching can go and have a look at all that anyway. But um, Nikki, it's been absolutely lovely talking to you as well. I'm so glad we've got you got you on because um, you say you, you're a, a member that's been as part of eye photography for a long time that you've, you've gone on to, to great, great and greater things that you say, you, you know, you've won awards from us. And now you, you're, you've got your own business and you're, a, you know, you're living the dream as to what everybody kind of wants yeah, to be yeah. when they're starting out as a photographer. So it's been lovely to kind of get that experience even if it, it given us like the the harsh you know realities of what it is to be a studio owner but that that comes with it we can't sugarcoat it too much but um so thank you so much um for coming on it's been an absolute pleasure having you here uh, thank you very much very welcome and uh, hopefully maybe we'll, we'll kind of catch up in another year or two and see uh if you now are the king of dance <laughs> you, I've a bit more gray here with a lot more here <laughs> you and me both sir <laughs> Les, well thanks so much anyway for, for jumping on nikki and uh if you're listening to this and if you've enjoyed it please uh follow and subscribe wherever you're catching the podcast anyway and uh, we'll catch you on the next episode